we're here to protect you and the, and the ones that you love. It's a good feeling to know that our efforts aren't going unnoticed. It actually brought tears to my eyes to know that we have this support. You're welcome. I must just say, you're welcome. It's stressful, but we're not going anywhere. Welcome to another edition of Bucknell Women's Track and Field Through the Decades. A special decade tonight. This one's near and dear to my heart. The decade I came from at Bucknell, the 1980s. And we've got some great alums on the call, joining head coach Kevin Donner and one of our current student athletes, Alex Butts. Alex is a senior from Parkton, Maryland. She's a pole vaulter and a jumper for the Bison, and we're really excited to have Alex on the call as well. My name is Todd Newcomb, and I want to thank Geisinger as our sponsor for tonight's event. Geisinger has done a great job throughout the pandemic, and they also do a fantastic job day in and day out with our student athletes here at Bucknell. They're a great partner to Bison Athletics, so thank you to Geisinger. I'm going to introduce our guest, and then I'm going to turn it over to Coach. And when I introduce our guests tonight, I'm going to introduce them with their maiden name, because that's probably the name you are most familiar with as Bison fans. And our first guest from the class of 1983 is Lonnie Furtek. Lonnie became the first female to earn all American honors in track and field after finishing fourth in the heptathlon at the 1982 AIAW Division II National Championships. She still owns the school record in the heptathlon 38 years after graduating and ranked sixth in the outdoor high jump. She was the East Coast Conference outdoor champion in the high jump in 1983. Indoors, she ranked second all time in the pentathlon and sixth in the high jump. That high jump mark was set in 1980, is the longest standing mark among any of the top 10 career lists associated today with the track and field program. She was the EI AIW champion in the 60 yard hurdles in 1982 and the ECC champion in the indoor high jump in 1983. She was an academic all district selection in 1983. Lonnie won the Christy Matthewson Award at the senior awards dinner and she was inducted into the Bucknell Athletics Hall of Fame in 1994. Our next guest from the class of 1989 is Heather Corhammer. She still holds the school record for the javelin with the old implement. That record was kept until 1998. And at that time thereafter, the current javelin standard began to be used. So she will forever hold that mark with the old record. implement. She won the East Coast Conference Javelin Championship for four straight years. She was also all East in the javelin in 1986. And Heather was a two sport athlete at Bucknell also lettering for the women's basketball program for four years. Our next guest also from the class of 1989 is Susan Rowland. 33 years after graduating, she still ranks eighth in the 100 outdoors. She was an eight time ECC champion, including once in the 400, twice in the 100 and 200, twice as a member of the four by four relay and once as a member of the four by one relay. She was all East in 1989 as part of the four by four relay Indoors, she still ranks third on the 55 meter dash chart. She won ECC titles in the 60, the 220 yard dash, the 200 meter dash, the 400 meter dash, and as part of both the 4x100 and 4x400 relays. She was named the East Coast Conference Outstanding Athlete at the 1989 Indoor Championships. Susan won the Bison Club Award at the Athletic Department Senior Awards Center. And was a first ballot inductee into the Bucknell Athletics Hall of Fame in 1999. And our next guest and our final guest on the call is Jill Wise, also from the class of 1989. She still owns the school record in the triple jump, both indoors and outdoors. They are the oldest school records still in existence among all events on both the indoor and outdoor top 10 list at Bucknell. She also continues to rank third in the outdoor long jump. She won three outdoor ECC titles in the triple jump and one in the long jump and was part of a gold medal winning four by 100 relay. She was named the ECC Outstanding Athlete of the Meet at the 1988 Outdoor Championship. She was a two-time All East selection in the triple jump. She became the first Bucknell woman to compete in the NCAA Track and Field Championship when she qualified for the indoor meet in the triple jump in 1988. She went on to place 11th in that event. 
She was a three-time ECC indoor champion, including twice in the triple jump and once in the long jump. She won the Bradley Ann Tufts Award at the Athletic Department Senior Awards Dinner, and Jill was inducted into the Bucknell Athletics Hall of Fame in 2001. So coach, again, some great talent on this call. Let's have some fun. Oh yeah, the 80s was my era too. And I graduated from college in 1984. So I was looking forward to this call. And also I'm a big history buff and I, I all the names uh, I recognize and the Hall of Famers here, what an outstanding era, outstanding athletes. We're, we're very excited uh, to have uh, you guys here. So anyway, let's uh, have some fun. I wanna hear some good stories here and uh, should be good. So first of all, we'll start with Susan. Uh, Susan, before we start uh, talking about some great memories, uh, tell us stuff about your personal life, what you've been doing, family, you know, things like that since graduation. Um, a year after I graduated from Bucknell, I went to graduate school at Princeton Theological Seminary and was ordained as a Presbyterian pastor. I then took a call out in Northwest Ohio, and I've been here for over 25 years now. Um, my husband found a job, and we're still here. We thought we'd be here for about five years. Uh, we've had two children that are Ohioans, which is a little odd to me, but one's <laughs> going to graduate from college this year, and the other one is a sophomore in college. So um, all of our family's still back in the Philadelphia area, and we drive by Route 15 a lot. All right, great. And Lonnie? Tell us what you've been doing since uh, graduation. Yeah, um, after uh, Bucknell, I got my MBA from NYU, um, but I married um, a wrestler from Bucknell. So uh -huh. my husband is also um, a Bucknellian um, and uh, he's an engineer. We, um, we also then both went to NYU for grad school. The, uh, we have two boys and one of them is a Bucknellian. So I'm a parent. Um, Bucknell class of 18. And um, he's also an engineer. Our wow. other son um, went to uh, uh, Cal Poly in uh, San Luis Obispo, and he's also an engineer. So I'm surrounded by engineers. Um, I work in marketing, um, consumer packaged goods, foods, marketing for 30 years um, with food companies, and I'm still doing it. So we're having a good, a good time. Uh, both my boys are, uh, are employed, so that's good as well. Um, so right now we're empty nesters, um, and um, it's uh, it's 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 great. We're in Northwest New Jersey. Okay, awesome. And Jill, tell us what you've been doing. You're on mute. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> when I first graduated, I headed up to Syracuse and trained there for a year and um, eventually moved to Kansas. Um, I worked in the early education field doing public policy and advocacy work. And I was also a stay-at-home mom. Um, my husband is the track and cross country coach. And um, now we're at West Point, uh, which is the US Military Academy. And so I get to hear about track and field maybe sometimes more than I want to. <laughs> <laughs> and I have Alex, three did, yeah. Alex oh, did you know that her husband is the track coach at Army? No, I did not know that. That's very interesting. And he's a buck, he's yeah, a buck I'm gonna, also. I found out you guys are coming here on Saturday. Alex does not know that. I found oh. that out literally a half hour ago. Alex, <laughs> we are not going to Colgate. We are going to Army. You're kidding me. So, Jill, who do you root for? That's who amazing, actually. I root for my livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> what what happened? What happened was uh, the Patriot League set up these pod meets instead of having a full Patriot League championship. We felt that um, too many people in the same building probably is not the smart thing to do. So, the Patriot League sponsored local pod meets. And we were originally supposed to host Lafayette and Colgate. Uh, we're having some COVID issues at Buck now. So we decided to go to Colgate. And I guess Lehigh was supposed to go to Army and they couldn't agree on the testing procedures. So uh, I got a, literally a call uh, not too long ago asking if I would rather go to Army and send Lehigh to Colgate. And uh, 
Alex, I said yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> you are the first person on the team to know that right now. <laughs> wow, I'm excited. An, I was going to send an email to the team after this phone call. So we will be at West Point on yeah, Saturday. Jill, so we'll see you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited about that. Wow. All right. Uh, then Heather, tell us what you've been doing. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I uh, re really two weeks out of Bucknell uh, started my career with Procter and Gamble and uh, spent my entire career with them and actually retired two years ago. I uh, was able to retire early. PNG was good to my family and, uh, and to us. Uh, it, we started outside of Philadelphia and then eventually went to Cincy and Arizona and came back, um, but got married. We have two kids. Actually, my, uh, my oldest, I actually live parallel lives with Susan. My oldest is a senior at Ohio State, the same age as her oldest. And uh, my youngest is a uh, sophomore at University of Arizona. Um, and neither of, none of them are in track uh, per se, but uh, I have since now retired. We are down here in South Carolina, living on Lake Kiwi and uh, enjoying boating, laking, kayaking, and golfing a lot. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, let, let's, uh, let's stay with, um, uh, let, let's go to Susan. Let's go back to Susan here and take us back to the beginning of how you ultimately chose Bucknell and the track and field program. Um, I was a walk-on. I uh, got into Bucknell early decision and, and literally I visited my sister. My brother and sister both went to Bucknell. I visited other schools and checked out their track programs and never really found one that I liked. I wanted to go to a school that will be unnamed in the South. And at that point in the mid eighties, they only had a track club. And I thought that um, kind of scared me about what Southern Southerners thought about women. So I chose not to go there. Uh, so I literally walked into the track coach's office and uh, one weekend when I was visiting my sister and said, hi, I want to be on the track team. And they said, that's nice. Show up in September. Um, so I kind of ended up at Bucknell through a family legacy of my brother and sister. And I really wanted to run. I did not um, run junior year in high school because I was injured. So I was not recruited for track anywhere. So I was happy to land at Bucknell in a division one program. All right, that's great. And Lonnie, how'd you end up at Bucknell? Yeah, so, you know, it was Title IX in the, the late 70s, right? And there were not a lot of choices. So I really, really looked hard for a school that had the academic caliber and that had a female track team. Okay. And that's how I found Bucknell for sure. Um, and it was Coach Goulden. So there was a really strong um, track and field program and I was a multi-sport um, high schooler. I, I, I was in many sports in high school and how I landed on, on track was by doing the pentathlon and the heptathlon. I could mimic being in multiple sports, but staying in one, in one sport and the fact that it had winter indoor and spring outdoor. So I could basically stay in one sport and do multiple sports. And so that's what interested me. Um, female track team at the time was very new. Um, and I did a, a, a large part of my training with Coach Goulden and, and the guys because of the, the, the field events. And at the time, um, Coach Mark, um, Mike Baker gotcha. was, the, was the field events coach. And I really benefited by training with the guys. And especially at the time, um, Paul Miller, he was a, a, a decathlete that was training for the Olympics. Okay. And so they allowed me to um, shadow him. And, and mm. I, so I got a lot of my, my uh, heptathlon training in. Great, great story. And Jill, tell us how you ended up at Bucknell. Well, I had a pretty unsophisticated college search and I had torn my ACL my, in February of my senior year of high school playing basketball. So I didn't compete my senior year in high school at all. And I, like Sue, was unrecruited. Um, I had one phone conversation with Coach Roy, and I don't even remember if it was before or after I was accepted. Um, so I feel pretty lucky that I got to Bucknell and had a really good jumping coach and 
um, was able to, to um, rehab my knee and, you know, be part of such an amazing team. Very good. And Heather. Yeah, I, um, I, I actually, as Todd mentioned, I was a two sport athlete. So um, my passion sport was basketball, but I wasn't as good at basketball as I was at track per se. I mean, I played for Bucknell, but I wasn't, you know, uh, one of the better players per se. Um, so I was looking at schools where I could do both. And a lot of the schools um, that I was looking at didn't really have strong programs in both. And um, you know, I was fortunate. I mean, I turned down schools like Princeton and Cornell and, and, and West Point, believe it or not, you know, I didn't realize you're there to go to Bucknell, um, largely because like acceptance rates into secondary education, I was pre-med at the time, were higher at Bucknell than they were at a Princeton or a Cornell. And I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And so to me, Matt and the report and Lori Howard was a very strong recruiter for me in basketball. So um, ultimately, and for back track, believe it or not, similarly, I was more of a walk on uh, to track than, uh, um, than anything else, but basketball, I was more heavily recruited for. So. Okay. Interesting. Alex, tell us uh, your story. How'd you end up at Bucknell? Um, so I was a gymnast, like for a lot of my life up until high school. And so when I stopped that as a freshman in high school, I started pole vaulting. And so I did that all four years. And then I started high jumping as a sophomore and I had just heard about Bucknell from my brother who actually played football in college and he looked at Bucknell and I like had some athlete friends who were looking at Bucknell. And so I kind of just like on a whim, like reached out and I, I really wanted to go to university of Delaware for some reason. Like that was like always like where my head was. And then I scheduled a couple different overnights and visits and I did Delaware and I did Lehigh too. And then I did Bucknell and it was just after one day at Bucknell, I was like, this is definitely where I want to be. It's just the people and the campus just like felt like home right away. And so the decision was like pretty easy for me. Like as soon as I got an offer, I was like, yeah, that's definitely where I wanna be. And I kind of thought that I would mainly be a pole vaulter. Um, like I didn't even really realize that my high jump PR was like even that good. And so I figured I would just be pole vaulting. And then I got here in September of my freshman year and coach Mantosh was like, no, like you're gonna be like a high jumper. like." almost a little bit more than pole vault at times. So yeah, that's how I ended up here. All right, great. Um, Heather, tell us about your most memorable experience as a member of the uh, Women's Track and Field program. You know, I honestly, I, I can't probably pit, I mean, probably the biggest, uh, you know, typical would be like our senior year winning the championship and, and winning, um, you know, starting off a great, uh, a great track program and building something and helping launch it uh, and finishing culminating with that. But honestly, it really was more the people, the, the, the going away to the meets and getting, making such great friends and quite frankly, the, the fun and the silliness and the goofiness and the singing on the buses and just, um, just the camaraderie and the, the, you know, the, the friendships that, you know, were formed and, you know, Susan and I are still dear friends to this day, which I wouldn't have had happen, you know, if it hadn't been for, uh, you know, meeting her through the track program and what have you. So really, I, I mean, it's a, it's a talented program. It's a very you know, well coached program. You got a lot of benefits from it, but really just being a part of a great team and a group of great women and, and people um, is what I remember and hold on to the most looking back. Great. And Jill, your most memorable time at Bucknell, your most memorable moment. You're on mute. You're on mute again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a few. Uh, the, I feel like, Heather, that the people and the camaraderie and working hard together with my teammates in practice, just pushing ourselves and getting through stuff to me was really a huge part of what I enjoyed about being on the team. And then if I pick two other memorable moments, actual moments, it would probably be going to nationals and going to the Olympic trials. Like those were, those were big and exciting, but 
I would choose the camaraderie any day. There were a lot of people that supported us as athletes at Bucknell. There were women that came into the, the locker rooms every day to, they would put their stuff in the lockers and take walks. Sometimes they would run and they call, they would decorate my locker sometimes. And I worked in sports information. So Brad Tufts was really always so supportive of me and, um, the secretaries that worked in the office that's now your office, that just the people surrounding the program and the actual team members were really, I, I feel like that was the best part of being on the team. That's great, great to hear. And Lonnie, your most memorable part of women's track and field? Um, wow, probably um, for sure, flying to to nationals I think it was Knoxville um, was was when it occurred to me how supportive everyone was like I'm being put on a plane to go to a, a track meet like as a whatever 19 year old or 20 year old that was just overwhelming um, but uh, the whole camaraderie and especially back under uh, coach Art Goulden uh, because it was all the guys and the girls it was a huge group that just trained together and and did everything together and going to the um, going to the calf and having our 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 sport meals after everyone else ate and then we come in and we inhale all this food <laughs> just an amazing amount of food um, and so the, definitely you know the camaraderie and all the and all the friendships but even the little um, in the in the field house the weight room was at the end of what was the old Hall of Fame, like the weight room. And it was a small little, but just the camaraderie of all the, um, the teammates and the athletes helping each other, um, especially back then as a, as a woman, there were not a lot of gals in the weight room and there weren't a lot of, of, of girls in, in the field house and, and training. So just the fact that everyone was accepting and took you in, it was, um, you know, you had your big tribe, it was great. All right, that's awesome. And Susan, your most memorable moment. Um, I had a really hard time thinking through that question because there, um, Jill will remember the van breaking down on the way back from West Virginia and um, <laughs> you know running in Yale. I loved that track. It was just like the biggest spongy thing. Um, I, I so appreciated um, the people, the, the you know the same people you ended up rooming with the same people all the time. So Allison Seger and um, Lynette McBride, um, Margaret Wilkes, uh, just some Susan Wallace, some amazing people that we got to know and spend time with. I will say that, that the most memorable experience for me was uh, finally, finally winning um, the ECC championships indoors. And I think it's because it was that thing that starting our freshman year was this is the time we're going to do it. And we did these crazy where, you know, we were each jumping in. They, they threw me into high jump to try to get some extra points with that chance that we just might get enough points to get past Lafayette. Um, every single year, indoor, outdoor, it was maybe this year, maybe this year, and then to finally do that senior year. And I say that knowing that Heather wasn't, you know, she was an outdoor person that year um, and, and Jill had to be um, kind of getting her knee back in shape again that year. But that, that was just very meaningful to me to finally reach that championship with the team and to be able to celebrate that. Great, great. All right, I think Alex has a question for you guys. Yes, I think we can start with um, Heather. And so what advice would you give me or any other athletes on the team right now, um, just about the college track and field experience? You know, if there's something that you did that you would recommend that we do, or even just for me as a senior, um, any advice you would have? I think you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Jill's my idol, so I do whatever she does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, like it's a and, and it's a life lesson. I mean, bottom line is, it's just whatever you're gonna 
do go all in, like, don't ever be halfway about it. And like, you know, just, I mean, I took one year off of basketball because I thought I had a shot at the Olympics in the javelin. And I was like, I'm not going to look back and wonder if I had really dedicated a year of my time to doing it and, you know, potentially miss that. And I did it and I didn't make it, you know what, disappointing that I didn't, but at least I went all in and I tried and, and whether that was in my work world or whatever, that's, it's just being committed and being all in on it. I think to me is one of the best things you can do, whether that's, you know, work, job, friendships, family, whatever, you just really got to invest the time and really make it a commitment to, to be your very best every day when you're showing up for it. No, oh, Heather, we have a pretty good javelin thrower here right now. I saw that like 180 some feet. Dang. Yeah. So she's <laughs> looking impressive. at the she's looking at the Olympic trials this year. She was actually on the Zoom call we had earlier with um, you know, the earlier group, the the 2000. Ah. Yeah, Mora. I'll have to watch that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then I guess Jill, you could go now. Well, I would just say to try to savor it you know be in the moment like when you're at practice just be at practice I know there's a lot of things pulling on you academically um, and maybe other parts of your life but to just be in the moment and really when you're there give it everything you have I feel like you get more out of it that way and uh, I I I guess it's a little bit like what Heather said, you won't have regrets about putting your all into it. And the other thing, if you, if, if throwing the javelin or high jumping is, is your favorite thing in the world right now, then like pay attention to what you eat and make sure you get your sleep and do visualization and, and hit, hit it from every aspect and every detail so that you can really, you know, get to your highest potential. Because there's so many things you can do. And have fun. If you love it, have fun. Yeah, definitely. And that definitely, like, hits home right now with everything with COVID. We've been having, like, weeks of shutdown with no practice and weeks getting canceled. So every time we're able to practice, it's like, I'm like trying to soak it in because I'm so happy that we're like even getting the opportunity to and then we're like supposed to travel this weekend for the first time since last year to compete and so I'm just like so excited and my family's been like well, aren't you nervous you haven't even like practiced and I'm like no I'm just like excited I just want to go <laughs> sure. yeah that's very good advice thank you um Lonnie I'll for you this weekend oh thank you <laughs> um I think especially for those of us that did field events um or all the you know, um, the events where you can't socially take it with you when you graduate. Yep. So like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you're not gonna go hurdle with some friends <laughs> or you can't just sort of go high jump, you know. I've tried throwing the javelin with friends. It does not go well, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, and even the equipment, you know, having all the hurdles, having the high jump pit, having the shot put or the javelin, whatever it is. So the fact that all the equipment is there and the facilities and um, it's set up for you to do it as much as you can and take advantage of it because when you graduate, now what do I do? I go cross country skiing, I go biking, you know, I'll, I'll you know, try and uh, do downhill skiing. We have so much snow here right now. Um, <laughs> but um, you can't socially hurdle and socially high jump with your friends. So while you're at Bucknell and you are surrounded with people who are doing those things do it as much as you can because it does get a little harder afterwards and you'll switch, you know, you'll, you'll, your passions, you'll find other places for it, but it won't ever be the same. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Susan. I, I'm going to go a different direction with this um, because I do think one, well, I would say pay attention to the people that you're around because they're amazing. Um, the dedication, the faithfulness, um, you know, Jill, Heather, we, we had some amazing just women that we got to hang out with, um, some of my favorite people. On the flip side, and this, I'm just going to go a different direction, realize that 
um, there's a lot more going on outside the field house and take advantage of that too. Um, I, I think you can regret not putting 100% into practice and, and, but you can also miss out on some pretty cool performances. I didn't even know, for instance, I had a really good friend. She, she was a dancer. I didn't even know they did performances. Um, and I, I found out like after we graduated that she was in all these different shows and things. And I thought, wow, I think I missed out. Um, I did go to a lot of basketball games because I was a statistician. So I didn't miss out on that side of the world. But take <clears throat> advantage of the university while you're there. It's an amazing university. And there's a lot of things outside the field house to take advantage of, too. I know not as many right now, but they're still there. Bottom line is savor every moment. It's the best four years you will have in your life. I mean, I've had great four years, but it is so amazing. And, you know, just suck every moment, you know, suck the marrow out of the life of it. You know, as they say, it just, it really is just a great time and take, take advantage of it. I miss my days there. Yeah, thank you. That's very good advice. I think like some of my best memories are going with my teammates to like other teammates to acapella concerts because we have like a bunch of people who participate in acapella groups and that's like something like outside of track that like we'll go to and it's like so cool to see people's passions outside of track like we have some like really talented people in, in those places so it's definitely good advice. Well I'm going to come back with a question here and we're going to ask uh, all you ladies to uh, who was the teammate that you most admired and why? And we're going to start with Susan. You know, it was funny. I was um, thinking about this and realizing in terms of who we looked up to, there, there were no people older than us. That's why well, I think there's this odd gap between um, like the early 80s folks and these this late, you know, there's a reason we're all in 89 for some reason. There were distance runners. Um, we had a couple sprinters that, um, but by sophomore year, we were the old ones. Um, so that was kind of the odd part of our team. Um, and in some ways there were definitely distance runners, both guys and girls that I looked up to, but it was really, you know, Jill and Heather, we were, um, that's who pushed me, that's who challenged me, that's who held me accountable those first couple of years until we really were able to build up a team. And it took, it took a couple of years until there were actually other people on the team training with us. It was pretty thin back then. Um, yeah, so it, it was, I was a little challenged. I was like, well, Jill and Heather, I don't know, who else? Who else was there? And I'll just answer because Honestly, it was the exact same thing for me. And I'm not just like, like doing the mutual admiration club, truly like Jill and Susan, when I, I saw that, I'm like, I can't think of anybody other than Jill and Susan right now. Those are, those to me were the people who worked the hardest, were committed, were great leaders, you know, brought the team up when we had down times. I mean, and then we're just phenomenal at their sport, like the best, the best of the best. And so We lost Heather. Uh-oh. <laughs> She'll pop back. Well, well, we'll go to Lonnie now. Yeah, Who's so interesting. I was sort of at the very beginning of the program. So literally Title IX in 1979, um, the original female track coach was Diane Ware, which was a runner's wife who was a former swimmer. I mean, it wasn't, so we were the ones kind of almost starting the program. And yeah, there were cross country runners uh, for, the, for the girls, but for, for female track and field, there was no one ahead of me. So it was, we were, we were the ones starting it, um, which is probably why the Paul Miller story and, and training with the guys and coach Mike Baker is because I actually was looking up more to the guys in, in, the, in the decathlon program, there, were, there weren't any uh, women uh, then. And, and we did then build an incredible team and a great program. So we had a great run, you know, 80, 81, 82, 83. 
Um, and we were winning a lot of different events and meets. And so it's the, the people below me that I think I remember more um, because I don't, I don't really remember um, too much on the track and field side, uh, field events for, for women. I, I don't think there really were any. Hmm. All right. And uh, Jill, who do you admire? Well, you know, I don't, I don't think I realized that there weren't older people. I hadn't <laughs> thought of that when I looked at that question because, no, 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 I don't mean older <laughs> past before me, but I, there were no other women. I can't think of any other women jumpers. I trained with the guys. Hmm. I, I mean, I, 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 there were younger, you know, there were people that came in that were a year below me, two years below me, but I, I mean, the people I thought of were the other, my teammates, my classmates, like Susan and Heather that, that, um, who were models for me of working hard and doing what your coach says and those kinds of things. Um, I also feel like they were kind, like, they were, we were a nice team. I think we were nice people treating each other with respect. I don't think that it, there was a, a lot of like little clicks on the team. All right. How about you, Alex? Who do you admire? I was trying to think about that like this whole time because it's so <laughs> hard for me to pick because there are so many girls who came before me and like, and the younger girls in the team right now that like inspire me so much. But I guess the two high jumpers before me, like Sydney and Lexi, like they were always with me since I was a freshman. And so like, they kind of just showed me the way with everything and they both were so committed to track. And like, they just showed me how to do everything and like showed me how to be like, just like a committed track athlete and like a committed teammate and leader. And so I definitely admire them a lot. And like Alex Kumas was kind of the same way. And like you were saying how, your team was like nice girls. Like that's how I've always felt. Like everyone is like so respectful and just like a friend to everyone and just supports you. And it's like hard to even pick a single person that I would like admire the most because everyone just has been amazing. Um, and then especially this year with the younger girls, like with COVID shutdowns, we have to pretty much practice on our own or in small groups and just watching how dedicated people are like in the face of adversity this year just like inspires me so much and like freshmen who haven't even competed yet who are just like so like hungry to like prove themselves and like just want to work hard like seeing them at the field house like all the time like on their own and just like everyone being so excited to compete this weekend is so inspiring because it's been like one of the hardest years any of us have ever dealt with and people are just like staying committed and supporting each other through all of it and so I like can't even pick a person it's just like everyone right now has been amazing. Yeah, you alum would be very proud of this team. Uh, we've been punched uh, in the gut a lot this year with practices and shutdowns, practices, shutdowns, practices, shutdowns. Uh, however, um, when we are shut down, it almost looks like a practice out in that field house, you know. And uh, there's, you know, everybody's there working out and getting it on their own. And uh, I remember walking out and uh, one of my bosses kind of accused me like, yeah, hey, are you actually conducting practice? You're not supposed to be. I'm like, I, I haven't said one word, you know, to these girls and guys and, you know, they're, they're doing this on their own, you know? So, which uh, I think that's a great, uh, great sign for, for the team we presently uh, have. So, all right, Alex, you got one more question. I know. Uh, yes. So we can go, um, with Jill first, um, what advice do you have about networking and finding the right job after Bucknell? <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> oh, I don't think that I followed a typical Bucknellian path after graduation um, because I was basically working jobs that interested me so that I could afford to pay my rent and train. And um, then I, it took, I, I didn't like do what Heather did, get a job with a company and then work for that company or in that field forever. I worked in the early care and education field and, but I, 
I took kind of a long time to find my place there. And then I started having kids and I, I was mostly a stay at home mom. I worked part time from home. Um, but then at a certain point, um, I stopped working altogether when we moved here actually to West Point so that I could, you know, be the person who went to my kids sporting events and got them when they were homesick from school or any of that kind of stuff. So, I, I mean, my advice is to find things you love to do and do them. <laughs> and, and that it's okay if, if you don't find your perfect job right out of college. I mean, you did go to liberal arts school, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, Lonnie? Yeah, so I was a business major at Bucknell, and um, I re went into, um, into sales and with, with Abbott Labs for about seven, eight years, and parlayed the idea of being with people and, and an extrovert with, you know, going into sales. And I, um, I made sure that I had grad school in my sights. And so if you are interested in grad school, you know, take the GMATs or the GREs, whatever it is while you're still in that frame of mind. Um, and then, you know, go ahead for that, for that higher degree. And then there's the chance for a career switch. Once you get that for me, once I got my MBA making the career switch, but um, keep, keep up the networking, the networking, it's real and it's huge. And I've seen it again, parent of, of class of 18 and his jobs are absolutely um, uh, because of Bucknell. And, you know, he's done a great, um, he actually went to the Peace Corps um, after Bucknell and was one of the evacuees because of COVID um, from the Peace Corps. And he's now in the, with the EPA down in Washington, DC and, and lives with Bucknell guys and, and is definitely because of the Bucknell network. So I see the networking now still working. Um, and again, my husband's from Bucknell. So we know a lot of people who benefit from the, the network still at this age. It doesn't go away, it only gets stronger because your Bucknell connections start advancing in their careers. And so your network spreads. Um, and so I would absolutely, you know, look at LinkedIn. Um, it's a real resource. Um, and there's a lot of people who are in great places and in great jobs. Um, and usually through one or two degrees of separation, you can find those people and they went to Bucknell. So um, it's there for you and, and definitely use it for those of us that are alumni. We're very eager and happy to, to help um, uh, newer alumni in their job searches and in their career paths um, because we've been there. So um, by all means, use it and you know, use LinkedIn and, and use the, the alumni net network. We're here for you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Susan? Um, I'm a little bit more like Jill that I didn't have a very traditional um, career trajectory. I actually graduated from Bucknell. I had received um, a job offer that I decided not to take. So I left without a job. And then it took me about a year to figure out that I wanted to go to seminary. So it, I, I think that year off was good. I think Jill's comment of do, do what you like. I, I've always said, you know, the, there's the follow your passion. I always say, well, follow your passion if you can actually do it. Um, there has to be some skill attached, but I think that that pays off in the long run to do what you really love doing. In terms of the networking, I think, um, you know, my son is a senior and my, my comment to him was always, you've got to be willing to ask questions and admit you don't know something. I think jobs are so specialized nowadays that I would just encourage you to ask and listen and, and learn that way and kind of admit when you don't know something. Cause I can also tell you from the hiring side that I could tell when people didn't actually know what they were talking about. So um, yeah, use the network, but ask questions and then, and do what you love. Even if it's not a, like Jill, a more traditional Bucknell trajectory. Awesome, thank you. Um, Heather, the question was, what advice do you have about networking and finding the right job after Bucknell? Yeah, great. And I apologize. Technology challenges had me uh, drop off again here. It's been a <laughs> yeah. challenging night in that regard. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I had a very traditional path, literally two weeks out of Bucknell. I would work 
you know, was working for Procter and Gamble, stayed with them for 30 plus years and retired from, from them. Um, but what I think helped me was leveraging the resources at Bucknell. I really, um, I don't even know what the career center or whatever they call it now, um, really was a huge, huge benefit. I, I wouldn't have gotten my job at Procter and Gamble if I hadn't um, leverage the career center. Um, so, um, and actually it's something, uh, Susan was talking about her son, my son's a senior at o Ohio state and I battle with him right now. And he talks about it being so different because everything's so digital. And I get that to a degree, but I really think there are resources at the school that, you know, should be leveraged and tapped where you can. And then I think, you know, I caught the most of what folks were saying, and I, I can't disagree. I mean, I can't agree any further that networking is such an important part I mean, I led part of PNG's talent and recruiting for a while. And, you know, there's a lot of when you submit applications anymore, it, it, it may be a long time till a human being even sees it. I mean, it's going through computer systems and algorithms that are seeing your resume. And, and you, may, you, you may have an awesome resume, but if for whatever reason, your buzzwords just don't line up. You may not get a, a shot. So to, in today's world, knowing people and having someone help you get your resume in front of people is really critically important because just sending in via LinkedIn applications aren't very successful. So leveraging resources like the Bucknell Alumni Network or other networks, like I know my kids through Procter & Gamble and my friends that I have now through Procter & Gamble who now are at Microsoft and Coke and places like that. No, oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But she gets for being out in the middle of the mountains where it's pretty. Yeah. Ohio's pretty. No, it's not. It's flat. It's really flat. I hate yeah. it. Oh. Okay. Well, that was my last question. I didn't know, Coach Donner, if you had more. Sure. I'll, I'll finish. This will be the last question. Uh, ladies, I've been here 20 years now as a head track and field and cross country coach at Bucknell. So I'm uh, becoming an old veteran, but I'm always looking to uh, become a better coach. I'm always looking for advice. And as a head coach, what kind of advice would you give me as a head track and field coach at Bucknell? We'll start with Jill. Oh, according to my husband, you can't get any better. <laughs> there you go. I was actually on the phone with him right before this call. <laughs> oh, he told, I heard him. <laughs> he said, I heard you're on a call in 10 minutes. I said, yeah. yeah. I said, I guess we're coming to your place Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I mean, I think you're a pretty good coach, right? You, you, I got to know you a little bit more as a coach when Sydney was talking to you a lot. Um, but I guess, and I think, I suspect you already do this, but I think something that's really important is to treat each athlete, to respect, recognize and respect the individuality of each athlete. And um, obviously from a training perspective, good coaches do that, right? You, 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 you know, some people are at younger training ages, you know, some people's bodies can handle more but also just as a whole person to, to be able to um, honor each person's individuality, I think is probably one of the best lessons, one of the best m types of modeling a coach in a leadership position could do for a, a blooming college student. Right. That's right. my advice. All right, well, thank you there, Jill. Uh, Lonnie, what kind of advice are you gonna give me? Wow. Um, I don't know if this is still done, but um, back in the day, they weighed us uh, on scales every day in the, in the woman's... Um, I have never weighed an athlete in my entire career. There was a scale and it was, and it was right um, near the showers and before you went into Carol, um, the trainer, the, the women's training. Um, yeah. And, and um, everyone had to get weighed. And to weigh women's, at, you know, female athletes, to weigh us every single day, um, I guess for people who were putting on muscle, it was great. We loved it, didn't have an issue, but I, I know that that wasn't good. 
um, especially for the long distance runners and, and, and a lot of those gals. So the fact that they had to get weighed in every day. Now we know more and we know much better. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so it's good, good that, you're not, that you're not doing that. That, that would have never been, done it my entire career. No. Right. So, so that, that was, you know, that was in early days. Um, and so um, um, that was one thing. I think the other thing is the fun aspect of celebrating, right? So when we would win meets, you know, because we had to then like, what, maybe we had what, 24 hours of fun and then we had to get right back into training. So letting them, letting them celebrate, let, let them have, you know, their, their parties or their, or their fun and let them get it, get it out because that is what enabled us to then come back and, and, and get to practice and go all in again on practice was when we got to sort of celebrate. Mm. Um, so that it, you had, you had those highs um, and that you then felt like you were participating in a lot of other things. If it wasn't the Wednesday night party that everyone else was going to, at least maybe you got to go to your party after, you know, after the track meet. So letting them have the, the fun celebrations, you know, sort of turn, turn a blind eye uh, <laughs> for, for 24 hours um, and then let them get, and then let them, you know, get back to practice. I don't mind that as long as they don't get arrested. <laughs> Uh, Susan, said that. <laughs> what's that? What's that, Alex? I don't remember you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I can do anything as long as I don't get arrested. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting as I was thinking, of, <laughs> um, as I was thinking about this question, uh, it was really a combination of, of what Jill and Lonnie have already said. Um, and maybe because Jill and I, I thought Brad Hackett was a great coach. We haven't really mentioned his name either, but um, he was a good coach and because I really do think he respected us as athletes. Um, and that was, I think any good manager knows, and I'm coming from a management side, um, that you work with each person with their strengths, with what motivates them, how to get them motivated, that that is really unique for each person. And obviously some of us are more similar than others. It's not like you have to you know, deal with 40 different uh, workout regimes, but um, I really felt like Brad Hackett, who was our coach, um, our freshman through junior years, um, really did that nicely. And he, and he was fun. He was, um, he was a good person and, and he was enjoyable. We had a really good trips with him. So I, I think it's the fun and the, how to, you know, respect each person as a unique individual. If I know Brad, Brad Hackett pretty well. Head coach at Muhlenberg College right now. Yep. See this. Yep. And uh, Heather, what kind of advice would you give me as head coach? You no, know, um, I the, the only thing I would say that I, I feel, especially as a field person, um, having you know spent four years is and and, and unfortunately since I'm having technology difficulties, if I'm repeating things others said, I apologize. But it's really the trying to do more to create the team camaraderie across events. I do feel like there was a bit of like, you got your throwers, you got your jumpers, you got your sprinters and you got your law. And like, how can we find ways to create more of a sense of team? Because like in basketball, there was, you know, it was truly a team. And I feel like a track has a bit of the challenge of there's individual elements and there's team elements. And finding ways to create more team within the individuals, I think is powerful. Yeah, I think yeah, one we, thing we noted was that the, you know, the um, throwers usually were physically not even around right. the jumpers and the sprinters, let alone the middle and longer distance people. Correct, yeah. At least sprinters and jumpers, we, we usually worked out together, but unless we were in the weight room, we didn't really get to see the weight. Yeah, we were either in the weight room yeah. or on the field. So yeah, that, that yeah. to me would be the only thing, but I mean, it's, it's great. It was great. <laughs> I don't have a lot to suggest there. Well, yeah, there went, everyone yeah. should just do the heptathlon. Then you get there you go. There you go. They, you're doing everything there. <laughs> I just want to ask Heather if she's been to a Bucknell track meet lately, because those people are nuts with their teamness. Oh, I haven't. I haven't. So that's awesome to hear. Oh, no. Bucknell is known for like the whole team is cheering on. At I love every it. Event. 
It's yeah. pretty impressive. It can That's be awesome. annoying if they're beating you, but it's quite <laughs> impressive. We we call but, it one umbrella. That's what we call it. We're one umbrella. You know, hmm. sprinters, hurdlers, jumpers, throwers, mid distance, long distance, pole vault, multi. We recognize we need that. And I'll tell you what, that has been the hardest part about this year is mm, have, I believe it. we can't really have a full team meeting and Alex will attest. Mm. We all meet on the pole vault pit and just kind of wait around we talk about the meets. We talk about, you know, what we want to accomplish and uh, we challenge people, challenge different event groups. It's a lot of fun. That's great. That carries over. That's the part we're missing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, meetings our zoom meetings or small groups you know but um you know we do feel fortunate to be competing uh i know the ivy league has canceled everything every sport they're not they've never met their team you know if you're a freshman in ivy league school you have not met any of your teammates coaches right. nothing uh that's one extreme and then, of course, you get uh, some of the Southeast Conference schools where they're just flat out ignoring COVID and you would not know <laughs> there's anything different. And hey, I live in South Carolina. I'm aware. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then you got the uh, Bucknell and the Patriot League and we're trying. Uh, you know, we have not yet competed this year. It's been a little uh, frustrating in that sense. But our kids are they're together. You know, they they're with each other. And that's something a little you know, that we have a little more than what others uh, are having right now. So something in between. And, and we look forward to heading out to West Point this weekend. That's literally our first meet. Uh, cross country, indoor, we, we have not done anything yet. So it has literally been a year since we've competed. And mm -hmm. we are excited. And we don't care where we're going to go. We don't care who we're going to compete against. We, we just want to put the uniform on and see somebody else with another uniform on. And <laughs> this week it's going to be the, the cadets of army and, you know, they're cool and we're excited, but um, we do try to promote uh, a good team unity. That's Thank great. That. So, all right. Well, I really appreciate everything uh, about this. This was very enlightening and I love hearing the old stories and, I love the history of our program and I love hearing from our alums and you guys were great. So thank you for having us. Thank you. What a great idea. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you so I'm much. Gonna, I'll wrap it up with some brief comments and first uh, direct those to Alex and Alex, I hope, um, first of all, again, thank you for taking the time, but I hope you really soaked in what these guys all had to say about the, the net, the Bucknell network and, not just uh, the Bucknell network, but you have the additional added security of being an athlete here. And that network is so powerful too. And my own two cents on that. My brother graduated in 1993 and he went to work in the uh, financial sector and he worked for Goldman Sachs for a while. And anybody who works in the financial world knows that around the holidays is when you get your bonus. That's what you wait for all year long. Well, right before the holidays, a manager and a security guard called him to a conference room and they let it up. A really tough pill to swallow. Two weeks later, a Bucknell alum in another firm who didn't even know my brother, but just knew that a Bucknellian was in need, reached out and my brother got a job with him. So the stories are endless. Uh, just know, as all these ladies said here tonight, you, you really don't hesitate to reach out to anybody from the Bucknell world, whether it's a, another athlete, somebody else in your profession that you want to get into, whatever it is, you know, use that to the best of your advantage. And then ladies, thanks for being here tonight. This is awesome. It was great to see all you again and uh, hear the stories and see you all light up as you talk about your experiences. And, and it meant so much to have you do what you did while you were here for Bucknell, but more importantly, thank you for what you've done since you left Bucknell. We cannot do what we do. We could not have a spike shoe program with 85 women on the team and 65 men without the support we get from our alumni. So I really appreciate that. And then for those of you tonight that tuned in at home to watch, we thank you for doing so and go Bison. <laughs>